age of imperialism, countries found that they increasingly needed a strong military presence in their colonies as a means of both exerting control over their lands and also showing force to rival powers who had interests in their regions. This was extremely apparent in naval matters, as nations needed to not only secure their overseas ports, but also ensure the protection of regional cargo that would be transported back to the motherland. Powerful warships would be needed to fulfill this role. Battleships were ill-suited to this job, however, as they were both more useful in home waters and were far too slow to hunt down raiders or other faster and smaller coastal ships that could threaten the sea lanes. It was at this moment that a new technology began to make itself apparent, the implementation of iron armor as protection on ships. This allowed protection on an unprecedented scale compared to the Age of Wood, yet it came with a price. Heavy iron slowed ships down significantly, and they would not be fast enough to fulfill this role. These so-called station frigates could not catch merchant raiders, one of their main missions. Initially, it was hoped that ships utilizing sail and steam power would be sufficient for overseas use, with their lack of armor made up for by the fact that it was believed ironclads were limited to home waters. The American Civil War put an end to this notion, as the Battle of Hampton Roads demonstrated that ironclads could be encountered anywhere in the world and that they were infinitely superior to wooden warships. Ship propulsion would have to improve first before fast iron warships could become a reality, and this was a technology that was slow in development. The old single expansion engine eventually gave way to the compound engine, which did not necessarily make the ships any faster, but it did give them longer sea legs, increasing their operational range. The Russians, always eager to experiment, were the first to produce an armored warship directly intended for commerce raiding, the General Admiral. Heavily armed with six 8-inch guns and two 6-inch guns, she and her sister ship, the Herzog Edinburgsky, were only shielded by a small armored belt near the waterline. They were too slow for their stated mission, only making 12.3 knots with considerable coal consumption at such speed. Yet they still were pioneers and regarded by the British Admiralty as a threat to their shipping lanes. The British picked up the pace with HMS Shannon and the Nelson class, both of which were armed with varying degrees of 10-inch guns and 9-inch guns. These ships were in reality simply scaled down first-rate ironclads or belted cruisers. Their speeds were unimpressive with Shannon only making just over 12 knots and the Nelson's 14. Lagging propulsion technology was the culprit. Most ships used the double expansion engines, which delivered poor results not only in speed but also in endurance. This necessitated the continued use of sail, which came with a higher freeboard, preventing turrets from being used. As a result, these early cruisers had a more traditional broadside layout akin to the sailing days of old but a little engagement between the British unarmored cruiser Shaw and the so infamous it needed no introduction Peruvian monitor, the Huesca, would have dramatic ramifications for the development of the armored cruiser. In the battle, Shaw and her smaller British corvette escort Amethyst scored over 50 hits on Huesca, yet the stubborn little ironclad took almost no significant damage from this brutal battle. Although the completely untrained crew of the ungainly ship missed all six shots they took at the British, the lesson was clear. Cruisers needed armor protection. As the family tree of warship design continued to grow wider with the Industrial Revolution, the cruiser branch developed a new blossom in its quest for an armored cruiser, the protected cruiser. These ships only possessed armored decks just below the waterline which protected the vitals, leaving the entire remainder of the ship save the gun shields unarmored, as a weak belt of armor covering these areas would be no more effective than no armor at all. Fascinatingly, the first cruiser that finally broke through with this design came from Chile, but still via the British firm Armstrong. The ship was called Esmeralda, and she was fast for her time, able to make 18 knots. She finally threw down the last vestiges of sail, ending an era that had spanned since man had first gone to sea. Her protection of a two-inch armored deck with cork-filled cofferdom along her sides rounding out the armor was nothing short of revolutionary. Her two 10-inch and six 6-inch guns brought an armament heavier than any before to a ship of this capability, and they were mounted in turrets, another change for the cruiser. She was fast, she was powerful, and above all else, she was cheap. Part of the problem slowing the development of the armored cruiser at this point was that navies only had so much money to spend, and given the choice between an armored cruiser and a battleship, the latter was the better investment. The Esmeralda birthed a whole class of ship, the Ellswicks 
which we built and sold to Italy, China, Japan, Argentina, Austria, and the United States. While the Royal Navy had built the armored cruisers of the Imperieuse class, their protection scheme resulted in them being called protected cruisers. They also retained the old sails, a trend that plagued warships from the later end of the 19th century. The Orlando class was the Royal Navy's next class of armored cruiser, and they were better armed and had a higher top speed, yet did not have as extensive a protection layout as the preceding class. The British judged the Orlandos to be inferior to the protected cruisers, and once again the armored cruiser took the back seat. However, the Orlandos had made their mark in one key area, propulsion. By utilizing a brand new triple expansion engine, which was not only far more fuel efficient, but also delivered around double the steam pressure, they finally enabled the ships and all future ones built to rid themselves of sails that had been present on every armored cruiser design up until this point. Yet despite these breakthroughs, the great powers, save Russia, all continued almost exclusively building protected cruisers, and the Tsar's ships were far from what one could describe as advanced, still possessing sails. The Industrial Revolution had finally brought about the technology needed to bring the armored cruiser into its final form, and now developments in cannon technology enabled guns to fire at faster rates, convincing several navies that their ships needed belt armor. While at first it was believed this fear could be remedied by a 4-inch belt, designers realized the ships would need more armor as light guns would be able to fire high explosive shells that would wreak havoc on the remaining unarmored parts of the hull. It was this pressure, combined with another revolution in naval warfare, that began the building of the first modern armored cruisers. This revolution was brought to the world courtesy of one Alfred Thayer Mahan in his 1890 book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. In it, Mahan argued that the nation that ruled the waves ruled the world, and that the security and interdiction of a nation's maritime trade were the pathways to becoming a superpower. While Mahan still placed the battleship at the top of the naval pyramid, he advocated that armored cruisers could be used as second-rate battleships overseas, and could even stand up in the line of battle if needed. Now convinced that these ships were essential for the preservation of their empires, the navies of the world began building armored cruisers at breakneck pace alongside their battleships. One final development came in yet another improvement in armor, which had evolved from mild and nickel steel into case-hardened steel armor, which was higher in tensile strength. This steel was lighter and stronger, enabling ships to have less armor, but still good protection. The new steel also ended the era of timber backing as an armor practice. This weight reduction helped the speed of the ships, which now soared. Additionally, it enabled the belt to be extended to protect more of the ship. Armor equal to the belt in thickness could now be put on the turrets, while the conning tower received even greater protection. Britain bought Mahan's argument that her sea lanes needed guarding, and concerned with the large number of protected cruisers of nations like France, Russia, and even Germany of all places, they began a new class of armored cruiser, the Cressy class. These ships were so well protected that their belt armor was comparable to Britain's Canopus class of pre-dreadnoughts. The Cressys began an acceleration of British cruiser construction. Between 1899 and 1905, seven classes of armored cruisers were completed or laid down for the Royal Navy, totaling 35 ships. The relatively new Imperial Japanese Navy followed their British role models and subsequently developed the 6-6 plan, calling for six battleships and six armored cruisers comparable to the Cressys to be built. The armored cruiser would be further vindicated in the First Sino-Japanese War, which saw the ships used to great effect. Meanwhile, the United States built the USS Maine. Often confused as a battleship, she would be one of the stranger entries into the armored cruiser branch, with offset 10-inch guns forward and aft. The Americans used Maine in exactly the purpose for which the armored cruiser had been conceived, empire building. When President McKinley received word that a rebellion had broken out in the Spanish colony of Cuba, he dispatched Maine to Havana Harbor to serve as a warning should Spain try any action against the island and the American citizens living there. On the night of February 15, 1898, Maine exploded and came to rest on the bottom of Havana Harbor. Though the blast likely came from an internal explosion of the ship's magazines, the U.S. was going through a phase of yellow journalism, where newspapers carrying sensational and outlandish headlines were being run with minimal to no credibility. 
the press decided a Spanish mine was responsible, and so the Spanish-American War shortly began. This conflict would more than any before highlight the usefulness of the armored cruiser and would lead to further construction of ships of this type. The late protected cruisers of the U.S. Navy, such as USS Olympia, were able to speedily engage in global operations, ranging from the Caribbean all the way to the Philippines. Commodore George Dewey led the Olympia in decisive victory against Spanish forces in the Philippines during the Battle of Manila Bay, an engagement further highlighting the need for armored cruisers. Shortly after the war's conclusion, the U.S. Navy built the Pennsylvania-class armored cruisers, which were so powerful that they were deemed closer to being light battleships than armored cruisers in the words of naval historian William Friedman. The Japanese use of the armored cruiser in conjunction with their battleships at Tsushima during the Russo-Japanese War of 1905 electrified the world, who now believed the long theory that armored cruisers were capable of operating with the battle line. Even as they basked in their triumph, a radical new type of ship was about to throw that notion completely out the window. The Dreadnought. The advent of the all-big gun battleship came right when the armored cruiser was beginning to reach its peak in speed, armor, and firepower, and immediately raised several questions regarding the ship's futures. HMS Dreadnought had been built with steam turbines, giving her a speed not too far from most armored cruisers, meaning it would be difficult for some to outrun her. Unlike pre-Dreadnoughts, her vastly superior firepower and armor meant that should the armored cruisers run into her, the conclusion would be foregone. But if Dreadnought hadn't raised enough eyebrows with respect to the armored cruiser, Admiral Sir Jackie Fisher had another design that would be so much more powerful than the armored cruiser that it would be the equivalent of when a 1970s supercarrier goes back in time to the day before Pearl Harbor in order to lay waste to the Japanese Navy. The Battle Cruiser. With that whopper of an introduction, we'll be refraining from talking about battle cruisers, as these ships deserve their own video. For the purposes of this one, the battle cruisers were simply better in every single way imaginable than the armored cruiser. However, most nations took some time to realize this. Britain had deceived the world in initially announcing that they were building a larger scaled version of this armored cruiser prior to the new ship types unveiling, leading the Germans to believe it would simply be a more heavily armed 9.2 inch gun armored cruiser. As a result, the Germans built the Blücher, armed with 12 8.2 inch guns. Of course, the cruel irony would be that only one week after the final decision had been made to authorize construction on the ship, the Germans learned to their horror that the British Invincible class would be armed with 12-inch guns, battleship-grade weapons. Too late to change the design, Blücher would be one of the last armored cruisers completed, and though she was one of the most powerful ever built, this was inconsequential next to the battle cruiser. Though the day of the armored cruiser was now clearly done, by the time of the First World War, the navies of the world still had many of these ships that had been shunted off to distant colonial posts or mothballed in reserves, and in the tradition of total war, these obsolete ships were called back into service. Immediately following the start of the conflict, the weaknesses of the armored cruisers were suddenly and dramatically exposed. When the German submarine U-9 sank three ships from the Cressy class in a single afternoon, the poor underwater protection of the armored cruisers was clear and unlike modern dreadnoughts and battle cruisers, who were at least large enough to withstand a single torpedo hit, armored cruisers did not have such size. Things only seemed to get worse for the ships, as the voyage of the German Asiatic squadron across the Pacific in an odyssey of Greek proportions would demonstrate. The center of this German force was made up by the relatively newer German armored cruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau, who preceded Blücher. They were led by one of the most outstanding commanders of the era, German Vice Admiral Maximilian von Spee, who had trained his ships to be extremely proficient in gunnery. When the German forces encountered the older British ships belonging to the beleaguered Rear Admiral Sir Christopher Craddock, C&C of the British North American West Indies Station, von Spee quickly and efficiently destroyed his brave but outmatched opponent. The British vowed swift and terrible revenge after the Battle of Coronel, sending two battle cruisers to the Falklands to hunt for von Spee. Ironically, Von Spee came to the British, as he dispatched two of his warships to scout the islands in preparation for a raid. When they saw the tripod masts of the British battlecruisers, the chase was on. Though it took the Royal Navy several hours to run him down and several more to sink the two armored cruisers, in the end the British victory was total. The concept of the battlecruiser had been vindicated in the eyes of the world during the Battle of the Falklands, and the armored cruiser's days were now truly numbered. When German raiding forces began attacking the English coast, 
in an effort to lure out a portion of the grand fleet that they could subsequently destroy the british utilized captured german code books to try to ambush the ambushers one such attempt resulted in the battle of dogger bank in this engagement british battlecruisers squared off with their german counterparts however to augment their numerically inferior forces the germans brought blucher with them taking heavy damage her crew bravely fought back but when a miscommunication from the admiral in command ordered all british ships to attack blucher she was doomed her loss showcased further the weakness of the armored cruiser against battle cruisers there would however be one more painful demonstration of the obsolescence of these once great ships before the lesson would finally be learned the battle of jutland involved the majority of british and german forces including many older armored cruisers who by this point had little reason to be there but were brought along because they had guns and any way in which the two sides could hope to gain an edge over the other was maximized. The British subsequently lost HMS Warrior, HMS Defense, and HMS Black Prince during the battle when all three came into range of German heavy units and were either blown up due to their lighter armor or pounded to destruction by the numerous guns of the German battle line. Jutland put an end to any notion that the armored cruiser could engage in fleet operations. If they wandered into range of enemy dreadnoughts, their fate was sealed. Incapable of fulfilling either of their traditional roles, the armored cruisers quietly died out, and few survived the post-war scrappings and treaties. There were some who managed to slip through the cracks of change and survived to see service in the Second World War, the most famous of which was the Greek armored cruiser Yorias Averov. To this day, she is the only remaining armored cruiser in the world, and is still in service with the Hellenic Navy, a fitting tribute to the legacy of these once proud ships. Thank you so much for watching. If you have a suggestion for a future video, please leave it in the comments below.